does indeed change everything. I hope before the Easter season is over, you will sing Easter People Raise Your Voices, unless you sang it last week. Okay, good. Uh, Because that's our defining story, is the story of Easter. It makes us who we are. Uh, But I want to go back. Uh, In Luke's gospel, from the very beginning of the story, Luke turns all of common wisdom and held belief upside down. That it's not, the, it's not the priest and it's not the religious leaders who are on top, but it's those who will humble themselves and follow Jesus. And it's not just the men, it's the women too. That's still a big one. Uh, but uh, the Samaritans, no longer outcast but included in this new kingdom that Jesus is here to bring. That worship is not just happening in the temple in Jerusalem, but worship happens wherever people worship in spirit and in truth. And so Luke turns everything upside down. So I want you to think before we get into the story of the two travelers on the road to Emmaus, how the resurrection changed the disciples' lives, people's lives that were in the the gospel story, and how it turned everything upside down for them. The disciples, any of you watching The Chosen, or have you seen The Chosen yet? if If you've ever wondered about these people that Jesus has called, They were not the high society folks. They were the tax collectors. They were the fishermen, which was the lowest rung of the economic life of Judea ever. Uneducated men who changed the world. Why did they, were they able to do that? Because of the resurrection story of Jesus Christ and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that he brought to them when he met them in that upper room on that third day and he breathed on them the Holy Spirit. Think of those people he healed and released from demons. Think of Mary Magdalene, who had been possessed by demons, yet was one of the women in the garden that morning to anoint Jesus' body for burial. And we get that song, In the Garden, which most of us love. If you do a top ten favorite hymn, In the Garden is always in the top ten list. But he met her there in that garden, in that gar- in that t- outside that tomb, and her life was forever changed. Think about Nicodemus, a member of the Sanhedrin, who came to Jesus at night to find out more about him. And we know he didn't choose to become one of the twelve, but we get Nicodemus again at the end of the story, and how it changed, knowing Jesus changed everything for Nicodemus. Jesus changed for us what a king looks like from riding into Jerusalem on a colt of a donkey instead of a white stallion. In fact, on that, that we celebrated on Sunday, but it was, pro- it was probably Tuesday, Pilate run, rides into Jerusalem on that white stallion from one direction, and Jesus rides into Jerusalem on the donkey from the other direction. Pilate, all the symbols of power, Jesus had none of them. But who do we worship? Who do we celebrate? Who do we remember as the one who changed our lives? And it was Jesus. He took the Passover meal, the defining story for those disciples, for the Israelites, and in retelling it and offering the bread and the juice, he created a new covenant with us in the bread and the wine. It's a meal that shows up in the Emmaus story today. Their understanding of the Messiah changed, not as one who comes to vanquish nations, but to vanquish our sin. 
is not one to be served, but to serve and indeed get down and wash his disciples' feet. By, by rules, even slaves could not be required to wash the feet of anybody. Think about where they've walked and what they've walked in. No one should be required to wash their feet, but yet Jesus humbled himself and did that. A king is not one to be triumphant in the expected way, but by dying and laying down his life for his friends. Jesus changed everything and still changes everything for us. In that same fashion, Easter changed everything and, I, and changes everything because that transformation, that change is not done yet. I want you to put yourself in the place of those earliest followers of Jesus. What must it have felt like on Friday night and Saturday night before Easter Sunday morning? What would have been going on in your mind and in your heart? I think Cleopas or Cleopas or, you know, depends on if you're from East Texas or not, how you say it. Um, um, he summed it up really well when he said, but we had hoped. But we had hoped. Hope was gone. This one that they had followed and had invested their lives in, who they had left everything for, has died. And they think, unlike Paul Harvey, that that's the end of the story. But you and I know that there is much more to that story. Uh, and Easter changed and changes everything. Think of the Roman guards who find the stone rolled away. And one of the gospel accounts says they fall down as if dead because if the body's not there, there's going to be stuff to pay with their, their superiors. But they've allowed this to happen. The Jewish religious leaders have thought that they had finished this rebel rouser rabbi off, that their power was still intact. Little did they know that Easter changed everything. Think about those women who have seen him crucified, who have stood at a distance and have followed Joseph of Arimathea as he takes Jesus' body down off the cross to lay it in the tomb. And they follow from a distance so that when the Sabbath is over, perfect timing, <laughs> uh, they can come back on the day after and anoint Jesus' body properly for burial. And they get the good news. He is not here. He is risen. Why are you looking for him here? Did you not hear what he told you while he was still with you? And they run back to tell the disciples that are still huddled together in the upper room for fear of the Jews. For fear of the Jews. Think about Mary. In John's Gospel, she's called a witness. And they go back and they tell the disciples what has happened. The men don't believe them, so Peter and John run back to see. Think about Peter. How was Peter changed by the Easter story? He was emboldened. He was empowered. He was forgiven. Remember, he's denied Jesus three times. But yet Jesus walks through the locked door and says, Peace be with you. And he offers them, I believe, Peter forgiveness and peace. Because you know in his heart there could not have been any peace. What have I done? What have I done? And if you go back and you read that part of the Easter, or the, the Easter story or the, the Passion story, uh, scripture says that the third time Peter denied Jesus and the cock crowed, Jesus looked at Peter. And I can imagine how many times has Jesus looked at me like that, Karen? 
And I can imagine what Peter must have felt like in that point in time. But Easter changed everything for Peter. It changed everything. He had gotten it wrong so many times before and denied Jesus. But now everything has changed. The other disciples, along with Peter and John, were in that upper room. And he, Jesus came among them and breathed the Holy Spirit upon them. Anytime the Holy Spirit is poured out, there is power. Old Testament, New Testament. And later that same day, later Easter day, Cleopas and another disciple, it says, were walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus. I can imagine still not knowing what to think about all that has happened. All that the women and John and Peter have told them. And I can imagine the conversation as they walk home. Now, this is for free. This doesn't cost you any extra. Um, I believe it's Mr. and Mrs. Cleopas. Because in John's gospel, we're told that one of the women, women standing at the cross was Mary, wife of Cleopas, or Cleopas. You know, depend on if you're from East Texas or not. Um, and so it would be natural for this husband and wife to be walking back home. In fact, they invite Jesus to come into their home uh, to, to have dinner with them because the time is late. So I think it's Cleopas and Mary uh, that are walking along, and I can imagine that conversation about what does all this mean? How, how do we go on from here? We had hoped. We had hoped he was the one. The story tells us that Emmaus is seven miles from Jerusalem, so I can imagine at the end of this eventful and emotional tumultuous three days they're exhausted physically and emotionally and they're walking home and Jesus comes along and walks with them not revealing who he is at first but I, I can see this walk being slow and hopeless as they go back home and then it confirms the story of the women one thing, let me back up for a minute. One thing about this story of, about the, the, the walk to Emmaus, how many of you have been on the walk to Emmaus? Nice. So you love this story too. Um, it's got, Luke's gospel is the only one who tells this story. Uh, and you get echoes uh, of, from the Old Testament of the story of Abraham and Sarah when God meets them at Mamre. It focuses on the word and the sacrament. And this is probably a story that was used in the early church, church's worship. And it moves from the table to witness. So they're, they're walking these seven miles to Jerusalem. Jesus comes, or from Jerusalem to Emmaus, Jesus comes and walks along with them talking to them and I love the way this story says what are you talking about and I can imagine the look they give Jesus like what are you talking about and he, he says are you the only person who's been in Jerusalem who doesn't know what's happened these last days and he asked what things and I think Jesus has a sense of humor here what things and so they tell him everything that's happened and that they had hoped he was the one. And so it's really, in a nutshell, a retelling of the passion and the Easter story from the mouth of Cleopas. And Jesus fusses at them because they've not understood all the things that he's told them that had to happen. And then I love verse 27, then he interpreted for them the things that were written about himself in all of the scriptures, starting with Moses and going through all the prophets. I had an Old Testament professor in, at seminary who was convinced that Jesus was not in the Old Testament. 
I have a problem with that because I see Jesus everywhere in the Old Testament. I, so much of it points to him. But Christ is known in this story when he reveals himself to them in the breaking of the bread. And I've always, I guess as a Methodist preacher, always taken this as a sacramental story, that when he broke the bread, they remembered that meal in the upper room. Leonard Sweet preached at um, Grace Crossing in Longview a couple of months ago for, for the preacher's retirement. And Leonard Sweet said, that, that's a good interpretation of the story. He said, but when he handed them the bread, what did they see? They saw the nail prints in his hands, and they believed, and he was gone. So Jesus is known to them, and I believe to us, as revelation. It's a summary of the gospel, the Old Testament scriptures pointing to Jesus and that he's revealed in the sacraments. These two disciples understand what's happened by remembering the story. Even though it's just been that morning that part of the story has been made real to them. But by remembering the story of God's grace toward his people throughout all of time, by remembering what's happened to Jesus in the week before, by remembering his passion and this tale that the women tell, they're remembering. And in remembering and by retelling, they begin to understand. I think that's why Bible study, why scripture reading is so important. And then the scripture says they return to Jerusalem. I can see the two of them, I can see them hiking up their robes and running the seven miles back to Jerusalem. I would have. I'd been out of breath or dead by the time before I got there, but that's okay. I, would, I, can, see, I can see them running back to Jerusalem. Because this story that we have encountered, we have seen, we have talked to the risen Christ changed everything for them. And it was good news that was too good not to share. What would have happened if they'd just gone home and talked about it till midnight? We wouldn't have this story. But they go back to Jerusalem and they tell the disciples, still gathered in that upper room, what Jesus has done for them, how he's revealed himself to them. It's not just the women that have seen him, but it's them as well. I think that one of the lessons for us is that we too have been changed by Easter. Now for some of us who grew up in the church and, and started out in the church nursery, maybe this is not as dramatic as it is for other folks who come to know Jesus later in life. But if you ever, you know, I've, I've wondered in my life, if I didn't have the parents I had, where would I be? Probably in a lot of trouble. My daddy was a millwright at Lone Star Steel, and we got by with nothing. And so that's probably, God knew exactly the kind of parents I needed who wouldn't let me get by with anything. But we have a witness. Our lives are changed by Easter. Whether we're a crib Christian or whether we, we've met Jesus later in life. We have a story to tell. We have a witness to share about what the risen Christ has done for you. Uh, some of you are my age or older, and so you remember a thing in the Methodist Church called Lay Witness Missions. Uh, and uh, this church may have had one back in the day. And I was invited to go on one when I was in college, and um, I said, well, you know, that's, that's really nice. I um, was at, working at First Methodist in Gilmer at the time. And uh, I said, but I don't, have a wit I don't have a story to tell. And he just looked at me, and he said, what do you mean? Well, in the early and mid-70s, if you hadn't been a prostitute or a drug addict or, or a member of a biker gang, you didn't have a witness to tell because those were everywhere. And I said, you know, I have no, I have no story to tell because I had the parents that I had. I had no story to tell. And, and, and Jake just laughed at me. 
And he said, darling, he said, you have a story and a witness to the keeping power of Jesus who could keep you from those bad decisions, those wrong decisions, to keep you from doing the things that he would have to save you from again. It's good news, friends. It's good news that we need to share that the risen Christ is alive. He empowers us. He walks with us. And he changes everything. We need to share that good news. We need to share our shared experience. And we do it every first Sunday when we celebrate Holy Communion. We, we proclaim the truth of the gospel. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. It changes everything. If it didn't, why are you here? If the story of Easter didn't make some impact on your life, why are you here? So I would say that if the your fact that you are here, or that you are present or you're watching on, on Facebook, you're either seeking to encounter Jesus or you already have and it's good news and you need to come be with people who live that same good news. I would have loved to have been in that upper room when Mr. and Ms. Cleopas got back to Jerusalem and he said, you're never going to believe what happened. And you tell him, he, he revealed himself in the Old Testament and through Moses and the prophets. And then he broke bread and we realized who he was and he was gone. And to hear that story told over and over again. And they were saying to each other, the Lord really has risen. He appeared to Simon too. And then the two disciples described what had happened along the road and how Jesus was made known to them as he broke the bread. He's still breaking open the bread of life for us today. He still seeks to come and dine with us. He still seeks to come and abide with us. He still seeks to come and make a difference in our lives. He still seeks to change everything for us. Why do we hold back? Why do we hold back? Well, I think he wants to call us to that same excitement that the women had in the garden that Cleopas and Mary had as they realized who Jesus was, as they came back to that locked room and where Simon has encountered the risen Christ as well. He wants to change everything for us, just as he changed it for them. Will you allow him to make all the difference in your life? Amen.